NASA announced on July 9 that it had awarded a contract worth $935 million to Northrop Grumman to build and integrate the first habitation module for the Lunar Gateway. The Habitation and Logistics Outpost, or HALO module, will serve as a habitat for visiting astronauts and a command post for the Lunar Orbiting Facility. The module will serve as the backbone for command and control, power distribution, and perform other core functions including hosting science investigations and communicating with lunar surface expeditions. It will have docking ports for Orion spacecraft, cargo vehicles like SpaceX's Dragon, future lunar landers, and later modules to be added by international partners. HALO is based on the Cygnus spacecraft that Northrop Grumman uses to transport cargo to the International Space Station, but extensively modified with docking ports, enhanced life support and other new subsystems. The fixed firm price contract covers assembly of HALO as well as integrating it with the Makeser built power and propulsion element. NASA originally proposed launching the PPE and HALO separately, then docking them in the near rectilinear orbit the Gateway will use. In 2020 NASA changed course and concluded combining the two elements on the ground and launching them on a single vehicle would save the cost as well as reduce complexity. Northrop will be responsible under the contract for preparing the combined modules for launch, as well as activation and checkout of HALO after launch. The integrated PPE and HALO will be the Gateway's foundation, enabling humanity's first permanent outpost in orbit around the Moon. NASA is targeting November 2024 to launch the integrated spacecraft on a SpaceX Falcon Heavy rocket. Ingenuity, the helicopter that accompanied the Perseverance rover on its Mars mission, has undertaken its ninth and most nerve-wracking flight since it first took off on the Red Planet. Flight 9 was not like the flights that came before it, the flight broke records for flight duration, cruise speed, and it nearly quadrupled the distance flown between two airfields. The ninth flight took place on July 5, and according to NASA, Ingenuity was in the air for 2 minutes and 46 seconds and traversed an area called CETA, which consists of rugged terrain such as ripples and ridges that could prove to be impossible for the Perseverance rover itself. Flight 9 was the longest distance Ingenuity has flown to date, spanning 625 meters, and also the fastest speed flown by the copter, which reached some 5 meters per second over the Martian terrain. The maximum height attained during the flight was 10 meters. During the flight, the Mars helicopter photographed a heart-shaped feature among the tracks made by the six-wheeled Perseverance rover. The heart shows where the Perseverance rover took a slight detour, perhaps to investigate some interesting rock or patch of dirt, before returning to its original path and heading on its way. Monday's flight is expected to provide science value by providing the first close view of major science targets that Perseverance isn't expected to reach for a while. Including this flight, Ingenuity has traveled a total of 1.6 kilometers during the past three months. NASA is currently planning for Ingenuity's 10th flight, which might happen this month. Last month, Chinese space agency launched the Shenzhou-12 mission carrying three astronauts to the Tianhe core module, the first module of the Chinese space station, Jiangong. And last week, two Shenzhou-12 astronauts conducted a spacewalk to install the equipment required for the long-term operation of the Jiangong space station. Astronaut Bo Ming Liu and his crewmate Hong Bo Tang left the station on July 4, meanwhile, He Xing Nai, the mission's commander, stayed inside Jianhe module. The two astronauts went out to do work on the space station while wearing China's next-generation Fusion EVA suits. Their tasks included elevating a panoramic camera outside the core module and testing the station's robotic arm, which will be used to transfer future modules around the station. The astronauts installed foot restraints and a work platform on the robotic arm and with its support carried out other assembly works. With seven joints, two limbs, and two end effectors, the 10 meters long robotic arm can transfer a mass of up to 25 metric tons. The arm which has a positioning accuracy of less than 45 millimeters will reposition modules during the assembly of the Jiangong station. China plans to add two lab modules, each weighing more than 20 tons, to the Tianhe core module next year. Once both labs are assembled, the Tiangong complex will reach its final T-shaped configuration with a mass of 66 metric tons. After about seven hours of exterior activities, the astronauts completed all the scheduled tasks and returned to the core module. The last time a Chinese astronaut left their craft was in 2008, when astronauts Zhai Zhigang and Liu Boming put China in the history books as the third-ever country to complete a spacewalk. The country's space agency plans a second spacewalk before the Shenzhou-12 crew returns to Earth later this year. A research team co-led by University College London has solved a 40-year-old mystery as to how Jupiter produces a spectacular burst of X-rays every few minutes. 
Auroras, the shimmering displays of radiance known as the northern or southern lights on Earth, are seen above the poles of a number of planets across the solar system. These dancing lights are produced when energetic particles from the Sun or other celestial bodies slam into a planet's magnetosphere and flow down its magnetic field lines to collide with molecules in its atmosphere. Jupiter's magnetic field is extremely strong, and therefore its magnetosphere is extremely large. As such, Jupiter's auroras are much more powerful than Earth's, releasing hundreds of gigawatts of energy per second. Ever since Jupiter's auroras were discovered, scientists have wondered how these auroras produce periodic bursts of X-rays. To uncover the sources of these flares, researchers used NASA's Juno probe, which orbits Jupiter, and European Space Agency's XMM-Newton telescope, which orbits Earth, to inspect the giant planet's magnetosphere. The scientists discovered that the X-ray flares are apparently triggered by regular vibrations of Jupiter's magnetic field lines. These vibrations generate waves of oxygen and sulfur ions that spiral along the magnetic field lines until they smash into the planet's atmosphere, releasing energy in the form of X-rays. These waves are called electromagnetic ion cyclotron waves, and they have also been linked to flickering auroras here on Earth. It remains unclear why Jupiter's magnetic field lines vibrate regularly. Possibilities include interactions with the solar wind or with high-speed plasma flows within Jupiter's magnetosphere. The scientists detailed their findings in the journal Science Advances, where they concluded that these kinds of findings could help us better understand plasma processes across the galaxy. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. On July 1, SpaceX teams at Starbase rolled out the Super Heavy Prototype Booster 3 to the launch site, and by July 8 they quickly initiated the vehicle's test campaign. The test campaign which was supposed to start earlier last week was delayed due to thunderstorms and intermittent lightning on Tuesday and Wednesday. On Thursday, SpaceX engineers successfully conducted a pressure test at ambient temperature on the Pathfinder booster prototype. During the test, the test article's propellant tanks were filled with gaseous nitrogen at ambient pressure. This test checked for leaks, verified basic vehicle valve and plumbing performance, and ensured a basic level of structural integrity. The ambient pressure test is typically performed ahead of a cryogenic proof test to assess the stainless steel vehicle's structural integrity. It was the first time SpaceX has performed a ground test on a super heavy prototype. According to the county's road closure announcements, SpaceX targets to continue Booster 3 ground testing starting on Monday, July 12 through Thursday, July 15. The test campaign will resume this week with a cryogenic proof test, where the vehicle's oxygen and methane tanks are loaded with liquid nitrogen. This test also tests structural integrity, but adds the challenge of thermal stresses to ensure that the booster can safely load, hold, and offload supercool liquids. The test also serves to determine the weld quality strength ahead of the flight. Earlier Starship prototypes serial numbers 1 and 3 didn't pass this test, and the teams had to change the design of the vehicle to support the high pressure needed for a flight. For SpaceX, passing the upcoming cryo-proof test is crucial before engineers decide to move on to develop other aspects of the launch vehicle. The test could reveal any structural and design flaws that will enable engineers to improve the next prototype in line, Booster 4. SpaceX founder Elon Musk said that Booster 4 would be the first to conduct a test flight. In his latest round of SpaceX-related tweets, Elon Musk shared information about some possible design upgrades that SpaceX will implement on the Raptor engines. According to him, SpaceX currently plans to increase base Raptor thrust to 230 tons. Last year, he mentioned that the Raptor achieved 225 tons of thrust, and his recent tweet reveals that SpaceX plans to increase this thrust by five more tons. He added that the company plans to increase the number of Raptor engines on the booster to 33. Musk's implication that 33 engines could ultimately be installed on Super Heavy is a departure from comments the CEO made barely a month ago, when he revealed a base increase from 28 to 29 engines with the possibility of expanding to 32 down the road. He added that all the 33 engines on the booster would produce 230 tons of thrust. So, in short, the booster will generate approximately 7,600 tons of thrust and will have a thrust-to-weight ratio of 1.5. For a heavy-lift rocket like Starship, a thrust-to-weight ratio of 1.5 improves acceleration off the launch pad, reduces gravity losses in the first few minutes of ascent, and thus boosts overall efficiency. In his subsequent tweets, Mr. Musk mentioned that the three central engines on Starship would be the same variant as the booster engines. These are the copies of version 2 Raptor engines that the company is developing at its California rocket engine factory. Raptor version 2 is a more powerful tweaked version of the existing Raptor engine. 
This engine has previously been used for test flights on Starship prototype models, the last of which was used on the Starship SN-15. Recently Super Heavy Raptor engine's marked Raptor boost was delivered to the Starbase for installations. According to Elon Musk, on a Super Heavy booster, the outer engines will be fixed and cannot be gimbaled, but can be throttled up or down. Through his tweets, Mr. Musk also revealed some of the upgrades that SpaceX plans to implement on Raptor vacuum engines. He says that SpaceX is yet to decide if the Raptor vacuum variant will be commonized with Raptor 2, boosting its thrust, or if greater efficiency will be pursued instead. He added that SpaceX is considering adding three more vacuum-optimized engines to Starship 6 planned Raptors, leaving ships with six Raptor vacuum engines and three sea-level optimized engines. In short, altogether, the Starship launch system will be powered by 42 Raptor engines on its mission. The booster will have an engine configuration of 20 plus 9 plus 4, while the ship will use a 6 plus 3 configuration. On Saturday, Elon Musk announced that SpaceX is planning to build a Raptor factory at Starbase that will focus on the production of Raptor version 2. The facility will be capable to manufacture two to four engines per day. Additionally, the California factory will make the vacuum versions and the experimental design versions of Raptors in the future. According to him, it requires to produce approximately 1,000 engines per year to create the fleet to build a self-sustaining city on Mars by 2050. In a separate batch of tweets, SpaceX CEO Elon Musk says that the company is already thinking about the many potential upgrades to the Starship launch vehicle to use in space missions. According to him, Starship could use its moving door to chomp up debris in space. To capture space debris, Starship will open its fairing door when it reaches a particular orbit, pick up the space junk, and close before Starship makes its way back to Earth. This idea is not new for SpaceX, Gwyn Shotwell, SpaceX's president, has said previously that Starship could help pick up junk that has been left in Earth's orbit and store it in its cargo bay until the rocket returned to Earth. Basically, go pick up some of this junk in outer space. It's not easy. It's not going to be easy. But I do believe that Starship offers the possibility of going and doing that. And I'm really excited about it. In a separate tweet, Musk says that SpaceX has also considered tethering Starships together in space to create a form of artificial gravity for passengers on multi-month journeys between planets. The tethered system will spin about a central axis, and those aboard the passenger ships would experience the sensation of being pulled down due to the centripetal force created by the rotation of the Starship system. Many SpaceX fanbase communities have been talking about Starship having artificial gravity, and this is the first time Mr. Musk replied with a yes under artificial gravity. Interestingly, SpaceX has already started discussing Starship's potential to launch a telescope in space. For such a space mission, Starship will be modified to serve as a foundation or space bus, which could carry huge scientific experiments payloads such as space telescopes. According to Musk, it is possible to use Starship itself as a structure for a new giant telescope that has 10 times more resolution than NASA's Hubble Space Telescope. Furthermore, Elon Musk adds that he was in talks with the 61-year-old U.S. astrophysicist Saul Perlmutter, who suggested it will be a great idea to turn Starship into a giant telescope. Moving on to other Starship updates, on July 6, a hydraulic ram was delivered to the Starship launch site and got installed into Starship suborbital launch pad B the next day. The hydraulic ram will be used to simulate the thrust generated by Raptor engines during Starship serial number 20's ground tests. These kinds of rams were previously used during the pre-flight tests of Starship serial numbers 8 and 15 to validate their thrust puck. On July 9, a cryogenic vaporizer was transported to the launch site by SpaceX employees. This is an air-heated vaporizer that uses ambient heat to evaporate and superheat cryogenic fluids. The vaporizers comprise a number of individual multi-finned heat transfer elements, which are connected in a number of different series and parallel paths. The fins absorb the warm ambient air and transfer the heat to the cryogenic liquid flowing in the tube. The heat transfer converts the liquid into a gas. The heat transfer elements are either made up of aluminium or aluminium with stainless steel linings. At Starbase, the vaporizer will be installed at the tank farm, where the vaporizer will use the relative heat of the atmosphere to derive the energy necessary for the vaporization of the liquid cryogenic propellants used in Starship. The eighth segment of the orbital launch tower is taking shape at the build site. Workers assembled the fourth vertical pillar of the segment last week. Once ready, the segment will be rolled out to the launch site to install atop the already installed seventh segment. Surprisingly, on July 10, parts of the ninth segment of the orbital launch tower arrived at Starbase. This indicates that one more segment will go atop the eighth segment to complete the tower assembly. 
This new section appears to be only a third of the height of the previous segments. Last week, new crane parts arrived at Starbase to extend the Liebherr LR11350 crawler crane for the installation of the tower segments. The thrust puck of Booster 4 arrived at Starbase on Saturday. You can clearly see the nine Raptor mounting points on the puck in this video captured by Ocean Cam. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.